Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 77 of the PE Geek podcast. And as always, it's an absolute pleasure to have your company. Now, I'm joined today by a very special guest in UK, Chow, a gamification expert who I have recently spent a fair bit of time learning from. Welcome to the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, so you are somewhat a visionary and a leader in the area of gamification, and um, I was immersed in your TED Talk from um, Lausanne, I think it was, and just sort of got absorbed in your whole um, you know, world of, of how it applies to everyday life and, and beyond. And um, for everyone else who may not be familiar with gamification, um, can you just give us a brief rundown about what it is and um, sort of what you do? Sure. So gamification is applying all the fun, exciting elements of games into things that what we call non-game slash boring context. So things that you have to do, but you don't necessarily want to do. Things like healthcare, education, working out. Uh, those are things that are you just know you should do, but it doesn't necessarily engage you. Whereas games are things that you just want to do all day long, and you know some people can spend five, six, seven hours a day playing, but inherently it doesn't create a lot of external value outside of the game. Yeah. So gamification combines the best of these two worlds together. Awesome. So, I mean, is it true that the the gaming industry was one of the first to sort of leverage many of these assets in their games, but um, inherently we're starting to see other places leverage some of those as well? Yeah, so I believe the game industry is the first master of what I call human-focused design okay. as opposed to focused design because, again, there's, never, there's no purpose to play in a game, right? You never have to play a game. You have to do a lot of other things, you know, go to, go to school, do your homework, get your training, pay your taxes. If the, even if you don't like it, you just have to suck it up and do it. But again, for a game, you never have to play games. So the moment a game is no longer fun, you leave the game. You play another game, you go check your email, you go on YouTube. And it's, it's just in this very tough environment where even if you have the best experience for one year, if after that it's no longer fun, people are leaving. So they're always in this environment of constantly figuring out how to engage people and have people want to participate and enjoy the experience. And this is why I think they were the first industry to really uh, nail this down. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, from, from that, you've obviously um, worked really, really hard to generate that Octalysis framework. Um, that framework sort of dives deeper into the different elements that you believe to have value in um, game-like experiences. So, I mean, the first one, um, what, what is some of those elements in that Octalysis framework that help identify good game experiences? Yeah, so the, the, the Octalysis framework is uh, something I created to help break down all motivation and engagement. And what's interesting is that, again, it breaks down motivation to eight core drives that drive our behavior. So every single thing you do is based on one or more of these eight core drives, which means that if there's none of these eight core drives there, there's zero motivation. No behavior happens. And so some of the core drives, uh, as you mentioned, uh, for instance, epic meaning and calling, you're doing something that's uh, because you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. There's core drive to development and accomplishment. Uh, you feel like you're leveling up, you're achieving mastery. Core drive three is empowerment of creating feedback. You're using your creativity. There's a lot of autonomy. You're seeing feedback and you're adjusting. Core drive four is ownership possession, basically accumulating and collecting things like stamps or even Pokemon um, or accumulating your wealth, etc. Core drive five is social influence and relatedness, doing things that based on what other people do, think, or say. So collaboration, competition, uh, group quests or gifting, things like that. And core drive six is scarcity and impatience. So that's basically, you, you want something because it's exclusive, because it's difficult to obtain, mm -hmm. and that drives uh, obsessive behavior. Uh, core drive seven is unpredictability and curiosity, which is uh, the drive that is heavily utilized in the gambling industry. But whenever you have like a sweepstakes or a lottery or a raffle ticket system, it has its core drive. And then the final one is uh, loss and avoidance, which is you know, doing something to avoid a lot. To, uh, prevent something bad from happening. Yeah, so I mean, I noticed that um, on your website, which is an incredible resource for gamification, that uh, you've gone in and analyzed many games that utilize the Octalysis, oh, sorry, that, that leverage some of those um, different assets. Is it true that not all of those need to be present in a game, that some maybe are more 
um, weighted and there's some that you know people put more emphasis on like does a good game experience need to include everything from that framework so uh, first of all you only need one core dev that's really strong yeah. to drive out the behavior so, so only one is needed for a behavior in, in any given one point of time however if you want an engaging experience for the long run you know one year three years some games people are addicted to for 10 plus years uh, generally speaking, you will see a combination, a variety of those core drives. Um, but some games are more heavily focused on what's called white hat core drives, which are drives that make people feel powerful and control, they feel good. So there's no sense of urgency. Some games focus more on black hat core drives that make people feel urgent, obsessed, even addicted. Um, so in the, lo in the short run, all their metrics look amazing, like <laughs> Farmville games. Uh, but in the long run, people... Uh, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth because they feel like they're not in charge of their own behavior. So then they burn out and leave. Mm -hmm. And then some games focus more on extrinsic motivation. So things you do for reward or purpose or goal. So it's like, hey, here's a new challenge. Collect all this, you know, level up to, to 100. But the activity itself, the gameplay itself may or may not be fun. And so once people hit their milestones or, you know, the, the badge is no longer interesting, then they stop doing the behavior. Whereas other games, focus on intrinsic motivation, the so things that they just enjoy doing. Like there's no points, there's no stages, there's no progress. So every time you play, you you know, when you're done, you, you, you lose all progress, but people still love playing it because the gameplay itself is so engaging. So there's there's usually some kind of pattern uh, among successful games that, that utilize one type of experience more than the other. Yeah, excellent. That's, that's really interesting. So, I mean, my question here, um, does does it have to be a digital experience to leverage some of these assets, or or can some of these things apply in offline context as well? Oh yeah, definitely offline context. So, uh, ga gamification is the study of gamification is really just understanding how the brain responds to stimuli, right? And and how and everything else we call them feedback mechanics that deliver that motivation. So just like games, games could be. World of Warcraft, which has a lot of technology, but it can also be hide and seek, right? No, no technology. And the feedback mechanics are just based like other kids keeping score. And last time I checked, you know, kids have World of Warcraft, but they also enjoy playing hide and seek. So, so, you know, a lot of solutions I design for organizations or universities or co-clients, you know, are, are offline solutions. Sometimes just a poster on the wall. Sometimes it's just flashcards. Sometimes it's just a policy change, you know, or just a game rule. The key is that does it bring out those eight core drives, right? You could have a digital game with a lot of bad points and badges that people don't feel accomplished. But you can have a teacher just say, hey, great job. You are among the winning class, right? And then suddenly you feel accomplished. So it doesn't have to be digital um, it, as long as it really brings out those core drives. Digital yeah. has an advantage, which is faster. You know, it's a faster feedback system. It's easier to customize response to people. But I don't know, again, you know, it doesn't have to be digital. Look, a lot of great solutions and examples that are analog. Excellent, excellent. So, what's the what is the lesson that uh, educators? Sorry, what is the lesson that educators can uh, learn throughout the studies of gamification in whether it's an analog context or an online context? Is there some trends or things that you're observing in that space that they could, um, uh, you know, get in tune with? Yeah, so for the educators, uh, and I have a, an online community called Octalis Prime, a community and I share a lot of videos in different fields. One is particularly just focused on education. But the key about education is it really needs to be intrinsic motivation. So Core Drive 3, empowerment creates new feedback, giving people meaningful choices, strategy, uh, giving them autonomy. Core Drive 5, social influence and relatedness. So coll collaborative play, competitive play, feeling a lot of social appreciation. And uh, Core Drive 7, unpredictability and curiosity. So every, every time they do the activity, it needs to be uh, delightfully surprising. You know, there's always, you know, they look forward to what's going to happen next. And so instead of thinking about, oh, grades or scores or punishment, you want to make learning fun again. You want to make the activity itself more interesting. And when you can build that into the learning environment, then, then kids are, you know, they're not doing it just to pass the class. They're doing it 
because they enjoy it so much. And of course, when you enjoy something, you spend, you exert yourself more and you get way more out of it. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I've, I've observed in recent um, years, people in the education space sort of throwing around the term gamification and then basically all they're doing is giving out badges in some sort of context and uh, as we've sort of discussed there's a little bit more to it than that isn't there there's um there's obviously all the elements that go into it and i'd be right in saying that that's not truly a gamified experience if all you're doing is just giving badges yeah it depends on how you define gamified experience in my mind it's a very weak gamification mm -hmm. if anything correct because gamified just means to make game like right to gamify and so if you think oh badges make something like a game then sure you can find badges in games but that's not what makes a game fun yeah yeah for sure i agree i've just seen that quite commonly happening in, in our space uh, where people are sort of presenting those and you know, ticking the gamification box at their class does it. So, I mean, my question now is, is there any um, any commercial opportunities out there for or any established um, companies that are providing gamified experiences sort of out of the box for education that you can think of? Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few. So, and some are better than others. Um, it's hard to have a generic platform. So you have things like Class Dojo or uh, class craft that kind of brings a bit more of that gamified environment to it, but these are just like cookie cutter engines. Mm -hmm. uh, the best type of gamified learning experiences they're usually customized for one type of learning. So there's something called Dragon Box, which gets kids between I think uh, six to twelve to be addicted to solving hundreds of algebra questions. And um, I remember algebra for me in eighth grade was a challenging subject, but now I'm seeing all these second graders. Just solving all these problems and and they don't even know they they're doing math they think they're trying to feed a dragon who happens to like to be alone so it needs to be isolated on one side of the equation and also dislikes irrational numbers etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, duolingo language learning app it's more it's a little more gamified it's more interesting uh, Khan Academy has done a pretty good job right I, you know I have friends who studied you know majored in history let's say and then 10 years after they graduated they they start wanted to learn about advanced math on Khan Academy, and they never imagined themselves ever wanting to learn math after they no longer needed to take the course. So uh, I think your your podcast is a lot of PE, you know, physical education, and that usually those are fun. A lot of people hate their math classes and science classes, but PE could be fun, could be engaging, um, but you still have to think about, you know, get, just because you have a game doesn't mean it's engaging, right? Lots of games out there are boring, they're failures. They also have points and badges and levels and all that stuff, but the key is they don't bring out those those eight core drives out very well. So it's important to think about how do you uh, ideally bring out those three core drives that I mentioned. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I mean, because I, I just love that that applies in both an analog context and, and an online context or digital context. And uh, it's a big lesson for people, you know, how can you extract those when you're designing your lessons to, you know, be or, you know, as engaging as possible. So with all that in mind, what does the future sort of hold for education and gamification? Is there anything that's sort of on the horizon that you see that's, that's going to be quite impactful? Yeah, I think gamification is going to be something that sticks because it's about bring engagement to school. Now, the t whether term sticks or not, we're not sure. So it depends on what people do in the industry. They could have all bad examples and, you know, people drop that. But again, the key, the ability to engage people to do desired behavior, you know, and, and enjoy doing it, I think that's going to always be valuable as long as our brains don't change that much, which I doubt in the near future. And uh, and sometimes it could be so well understood and adopted that you don't even call the gamification anymore. It's just regular design. It's like you don't go to a website these days and say, whoa, this website is a Web 2.0, right? Because you know, if you're familiar with the Web 2.0 movement, it's, you know, it says, oh, now inter websites should be interactive now. They should, it's not just one way. You know, there's, there's like, uh, there's Ajax where it suddenly changes in front of you. And that's, that's, that's like the default these days. So uh, gamification can just be, embedded in, in every corner of society and everyone's just enjoying what they're doing uh, as opposed to be forced to it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, and there's so many potential applications 
Um, you know, even just in the general day-to-day -day world, I remember seeing the speed camera lottery. Is is that something that you've seen in, in other areas as well? Or um, I think it was Sweden or Norway where they had the people who were slowing down, ending up, ending up in a raffle ticket entry for those, the prize money of people who were speeding. Is Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I'm quite familiar with it. Yeah. So, it so that's a seven unpredictable curiosity design. Right. Patch your ownership and possession. So... As long as you did, as long as you're doing the good behavior, then you might win money from the people who are doing the bad behavior. Excellent. So, so that's Excellent. an interesting design. Yeah. Um, in, that's that that's an analog solution, right? I did something before where I was running a workshop and I wanted more people to participate. And so there are other people in the industry where if they participate, what they do is they just throw out a little plushie toy, and this is what so people say, "Oh, I want the plushie, so I'm going to participate more." So that's more of a uh, core drive for ownership possession type of design, right? I want the extrinsic motivation of the plushie, and therefore I, 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 I participate. What I did is I, can, I thought about how to increase those three core drives, empowerment of creativity, social influence, and unpredictable curiosity. So when they uh, participate and they give a good answer, instead of giving them a reward, I give them a magnetic dart. And I tell them, at the end of this workshop, this 12-hour workshop, we're going to play a dart-throwing game. And, you know, everyone has one score, but if you have more darts, you have more tries. So, you, you know, you don't, you risk less of embarrassing yourself and having a zero score. And then if you win the dart match, then you have a major prize. So then suddenly, again, I'm not getting, I'm not giving them the reward. I'm giving them a chance to play, right? So the more they participate, the more they can play later. And everyone enjoy the dart throwing game. There are people who were online through the workshop and they're from another time zone. So they pulled an all-nighter. They, they were on the workshop for, for like 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. And I told them, hey, you know, the workshop's ended. Online people can go to bed. Uh, the offline people will play the dark game now. And they actually said, hey, can you turn the camera around? We want to see, you know, who wins. <laughs> so it's just a very engaging process. And everyone's excited because they don't know if they're going to get the reward, right? They, they can participate. If they participate, they might get the reward. So, so it's interesting. And so that just made the whole experience a lot more intrinsically fun and rewarding. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of parallels there to, you know, what physical educators can do or education um, people can do. Rather than just giving the reward, create the conditions where they might get the reward uh, and then see engagement increase. I think that's phenomenal. So um, we could talk talk for hours around this, but I'm sure you've got a lot of resources on your site that people can go through and, and you know, complete at their leisure if they want to know more. So where could they find out more if, if that's up, up, up their alley? Yeah, so I share a lot of information on my blog, yukaichao.com, Y-U-K-A-I-C-H-O-U.com. Uh, I have a book called Actionable Gamification, Beyond Points, Badges, and Leaderboards. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of good content from there. And recently, I just launched our uh, premium community called Octalysis Prime and uh, sharing a lot of things about how to apply gamification to improve things like education, productivity, healthcare, well-being, relationships, stuff like that. So but that's... That's more of a, a premium community, so, so people have to uh, decide it's worthy of their investment. Yeah, excellent. Well, I want to thank you for, for stopping by and sharing uh, all your wisdom around um, gamification. And we'll have a link to all the different resources and so on that have been mentioned at thepeergeek.com forward slash 77 for episode 77. So, yeah, thank you, and um, I look forward to speaking soon. Great. Likewise. Likewise.